Hey everyone, welcome back to the Quest for the Best. This is the podcast where we're taking a look at every single Best Picture winner from all time, ranking them, and we're viewing them in random order. And this week, the random spin wheel pulled up for us, The Bridge on the River Kwai, directed by David Lean. We're going to be talking about it. It's, a, it's an interesting movie. I say that every week, but most weeks <laughs> it's correct, right? Yeah, I'd say most weeks it's correct. Um, David Lean. He uh, directed it from 1957. It's about World War II, so we've had some Vietnam War movies. We've had some other World War II movies, but we'll see how this stacks up. Um, but first, let's just do a little housekeeping real quick. We talked about the deer hunter last week. Vietnam, we're shifting around in the war world um, with these this little spree of movies. The deer hunter ended up at 22nd place out of our list of 33 movies. But after the end of this episode, that list will be 34 movies long, and somewhere on it, the bridge on the river Kwai will sit. So let's just get right in. Um, someone want to give us a, uh, a, car- a, a description of the movie, a plot synopsis? If not, I can, I can handle it. Timo, why don't you go ahead and knock out that plot synopsis? You're the, you're the David Lean fan. I there, am, so I am you, a you pretty go big ahead. David Lean fan. Um, I'd actually not seen this movie before we watched mm-hmm. it for, for this episode here. But basically, it's about a group of British POWs who are Um, held prisoner by the Japanese in World War II in Burma, which is now Myanmar. And um, they are forced to build a bridge over the River Kwai. And the general, yeah, that's where the title comes from. The general um, (laughs) says that, you know, well, we're Brits. We're we're British soldiers. We have to do this right. And so he ends up becoming so obsessed with this bridge that he almost becomes his own, like, camp master and overtaking um, Colonel Saito, the Japanese. And then there's a mm-hmm. side plot where the British special forces are like, this bridge is not good. It's going to allow the Japanese to do things that we don't want them to do. We have to blow it up. And, uh, well, that's, uh, that's the central conflict of the film. Will they build it? Will they blow it up? What happens? So what did you guys think? What was your, uh, your first impressions of this movie? Here's one thing I want to in- interject with before we even get, get to our thoughts. Mm-hmm. This, this, this film is based on a book. Mm-hmm. The book is called The Bridge over the river kwai oh my goodness the film is called the bridge on the river kwai and Mm. i don't understand why that is and i'm frankly not sure which is correct but i just Mm. wanted to intercede with that before we begin well uh i'm gonna go i'm gonna call this the bridge on the river kwai because i think this movie having not read the book is probably superior to the book because i very very much enjoyed this film i think it is an achievement in uh performances i think it's achievement in directing and in production and also the themes and the way the characters act and react to each other we have a pretty solid ensemble cast here Wait, uh, I, and they I, all I deliver powerful performances to, to tell what the cast was but you're right oh yeah you're, sure. you're totally right tanner yes um, there's, it's quite an ensemble cast uh real quick i'll go over it um, mm. Notably, I guess for our viewing purposes, Alec Guinness is our is probably the most recognizable actor. William Obi-Wan. Holden, yeah, yeah. Old, old Ben Kenobi shows up in this movie. Mm-hmm. If uh, you're inclined to believe that, Jack Hawkins <laughs> is in this film. Um, some, you know, these are is Sesu Hayakawa plays Colonel Saito, um, who mm-hmm. I was doing a little trivia reading, and he was like one of the first Asian Amer- American actors to be in Hollywood and to be in the movie industry. And he had a long and, and very successful career and, you know, did pretty well in this movie. Big. Yes. This is a David Lean cast. These are David mm. Lean players. He really likes these guys. Um, but yeah, you're right. Abram, your thoughts on it? Um, I like this movie a lot more than I expected to. Uh, I, I think that it starts to lose the plot a little bit in the second half for me. I think when we when we get to the the demolition of the bridge, I think we lose what is such a fascinating dynamic uh, between Saito and Alec Guinness. I really love that, and I think that sits at the heart of both the narrative and thematic uh, material. And when we start to introduce the the other plot line, I love the idea of the culmination of the explosion of the bridge. I think that's mm-hmm. really clever, but I'm not sure how I feel about splitting the film the way it does because I just don't think that, that cast of characters is as compelling and as fleshed out mm. as those in the camp. So on the whole, I really enjoyed it, but I've got some issues with the structure, I'd say. Sure. Yeah. Um, as we said, I'm a David Lean fan. I really love Lawrence of Arabia. Like, hard to overstate how much I love that movie. And I really love Dr. Zhivago, his other film, in the similar ilk. They're, they're all 
big movies, big casts, big sets. This is the kind of stuff that David Lean is is more known for contemporarily. Um, he's done other stuff too, but I like this film a lot. I think it's really interesting to see how he goes from this film into making Lawrence of Arabia next, which also won Best Picture, which we'll get to someday in the who knows when future. Um, and there's there's for me, there's so much to love about this movie, but I do agree with you, Abram. I think that the some of the plotting was weird. Tanner, you were talking about this uh, this before we started recording, but there's there's some weird inclusions here that are a little yes. a little strange um, throughout the film. But you know, I think thematically, I think acting wise, I think like filmmaking wise, this is a super solid movie that um, gets me going, makes me like, yeah, David Lean. <laughs> yes. Well, if I may talk about some some of the achievements that this film won, especially at the Oscars, uh, we'll we'll go over the wins and noms here a second, if I may. Uh, obviously, this won Best Picture. Uh, it all, I like Guinness won Best Lead Performance. Uh, David Lean won Best Director, well deserved, I believe. Uh, best Writing Screenplay Based on a Material from Another Medium, Adapted Screenplay, basically. Uh, it won that. I have an interesting beat of trivia, which I'll get to after I wrap up here. Uh, best Cinematography, I think also very much deserved. Uh, it also won Best Editing and Best Music. Uh, and it was nominated, and Sesu Hayakawa was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty extensive list. Um, more in the, kind of in the big names, well, too. Yes. That's like yes. how uh, many out of how many did it not win that year? Like, oh, I don't, I don't even I don't know how many <laughs> they awarded back then. It was all messed up. But I have a big I have a quick uh, interesting bit of, bit of trivia about the uh, the writing award for this because so this uh, let me let me pull up these names here a second. Give me one <laughs> moment. Uh, yes. OK, so screenwriters Michael Wilson and Carl Foreman actually wrote the screenplay for this film. But thanks to our good old friend, Senator Joseph McCarthy, they are not allowed to work in Hollywood because they there are some tenuous ties to them and uh, allegedly to uh, to a communist group or a party or something of that nature. So when this film won Best Writing, the, f the award was given to and the credit was given to Peter Boole, who wrote the who wrote the book and had nothing to do with the actual screenplay for this film. Uh, he was also French, so he didn't speak English, so he wasn't there to accept the award. So producer Sam Spiegel went up to accept it, and David Lean, after the ceremony, uh, was pretty pissed off about the whole cut. Pretty pissed off about the whole thing. Wow, that's huh. That is really interesting to see how a little bit of McCarthyism mm -hmm. plays into these films. Yes. Well, I think let's. I just want to move through this movie chronologically and 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 think sure. of, and and we'll think about themes and and whatnot as we go along because I I do want to explore this idea of like the two our two leading men our Japanese you mm -hmm. know Colonel Saito and then Colonel Nicholson and these two guys who come in and they're very different and they're very opposed at the beginning and they they come together to um, end up working together in this very interesting dynamic that this film takes a look at. Um, and as a war movie, I think it's it's very interesting in that it's really not about the war at all. I mean, the war is in the background and, and shows us, you know, okay, this is why they're here. And and there's certain, you know, the Geneva Convention is brought up a lot in the beginning. Um, <laughs> pretty, it's some some lighter bits there, lighter moments for the, you know, with the, with the book and whatnot. But I really like how it dives in and is very particular about the characters. You've got Colonel Nicholson who wants to build this bridge. Like, really, that's what he wants to do. It's a very <laughs> yeah. simple motivation. And you've got, um, you know, the Colonel, well, I just forgot his name, Sai Saito. Colonel Saito, um, who doesn't want to have to kill himself. But there's this mm -hmm. tension between the whole film of, like, well, is it is the bridge going to get done? Is he going to have to, uh, you know, commit sup seppuku? And mm. uh, and so I think that's that's really interesting and a, and a good dynamic to really frame this larger narrative of building a bridge, which is a not a very character focused objective. No, I think the film builds tension really efficiently. The the sequences are, that are more overt, like when Saito has the men in the truck pull out the Gatling gun to threaten to mow down the officers, are more overt. But I really like what sort of happens in the space between spaces when we have. Uh, Nichols in like in the oven, I believe they call it, and mm -hmm. we're kind of waiting for things to unfold and waiting for things to happen. There's a really great sense of metered tension that builds to really excellent payoffs, especially when 
Saito, you know, eventually takes him out and kind of claims an armistice all of a sudden, kind of <laughs> out of nowhere, maybe. There's just a great payoff to everything that happens in that arc. And I love watching that dynamic then flip as the British officers then start to take control and the the, the excellent sequence where they're having the, the meeting and they're asking for tea and people are shouting for tea and we're getting dinner and <laughs> Saito is just shrinking into himself in the sort of dynamic where he realizes that maybe my life just got saved, but I've been completely dishonored by these yes. men who are supposed to be at prisoners. I think it's so nuanced and interesting. Yeah, those, yeah all of the stuff that you just said there is never really said. None of that is ever communicated in the film. You just watch it and understand that that's what's really going on. There's, mm -hmm. I remember there's a shot. The, the, the shot of Saito weeping is like incredible when he i think it's before he he it's it's the like the moment where you're like oh he has to work with these guys he has to let them build this bridge or else he won't finish it on time because it's just not going to work and he's sitting there on his bed and he's weeping and talk about show don't tell there's nothing is told in that shot and everything is just like mm -hmm. it, there's a lot happening and yet there's no dialogue there's very little sound there's no music it's just this performance and the greater context of that build up and that tension like you said yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, also Saito and Nicholson's sort of struggle for uh, to, to assert one of them over the other and like their struggle for power, especially how it's set up in the beginning. Obviously, Nicholson is adamant that his officers will not work on the bridge because it's against the Geneva Conventions. And you see Saito going about, you know, very cruel and uh, very regimented ways of uh not only ordering around the British POWs, but it's also his own men. One little moment that I really enjoyed was when uh, it's like that giant torrential downpour and like one of his guards is standing like one step back from the rain spout. So he's like, you're not, supposed, you're not supposed to stand there. You're supposed to stand one step up. So he makes him stand directly under the just torrential downpour from this rain spout just because he's he's very regimented and he's trying to assert his power, not only because he's, you know, a, a colonel in the Japanese army, but also in front of these British POWs and especially Colonel, Colonel Nicholson. Yeah, Abram, you talked about that scene, the meeting scene. And for me, that one's that was really interesting. And it, it's not funny, and I didn't take it as funny, but I it humored me in how I was like, so clearly the table is, had been flipped at that point. They had mm -hmm. the agenda, they had paper, they were asking for tea, like you said. They were, you know, okay, well, we need to do this, and we need to move the bridge, and we need to, you know, we're going to have to, here's the schedules, and and it was functioning like a normal meeting, but in the back of your head, you're like, well, this is a this is a POW camp. Like, these guys are not free. Like, they're just, like, letting them have free reign, and I thought that um, interaction there was very interesting. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, a quick question oh, yep. about the a quick question about the Geneva Convention because <laughs> I know you two are experts obviously yeah of course so it, it's it's explicitly outlined that officers aren't allowed to work in POW camps but uh why does the Geneva Conventions allow POW camps uh, just a, just an, just an open ended question right there <laughs> not really sure I don't think POW camps yeah. are supposed to be like work camps uh i think they're just supposed to hold you there until the war is done and then let you go that's like the ideal okay. situation but obviously that's not what happens in real life yeah obviously okay uh what is i have, I have some other great uh, saito v nicholson moments that okay. i have here oh when he especially when they're talking about when they have that first initial argument and he's saito's trying to like tear down the men and like convince them that no the officers should work and he brings up the fact that, you know, the officers bear the dishonor of the surrender that these soldiers underwent. It, and it's a real, really great moment of not only the characters clashing, but that idea of, like, uh, Japanese military honor versus, like, regimented British uh, rules of war, like, really clashing uh, identities and ideologies. I think that's great. Yeah. Abram, you got any thoughts on uh, on on this here this section towards the beginning of the film? Because I think this is, you know, it starts a little slow, but when we're in the th mm -hmm. we're in the thick of it, that's a, one of my favorite parts of the movie. Well, I, I think we, we've touched on a lot of what I wanted to cover. I, I think that there's some interesting dynamics within the camp that go beyond um, the colonels. I really like the uh, what what's the name of the um, American Navy man again. Shears? I forget. Shears, yeah. Yeah, Shears. Right, Shears. I love the idea of here of Shears trying to get himself on the sick list and the sort of mm -hmm. bribery and 
politicking that happens within the camp and with the the sick bay and everything. I think that's all really interesting and I think that's why I'm a little bit disappointed by how it doesn't remain foregrounded throughout the entire film. Yes. Um, and really I think from when we begin the magnificent and amazing deus ex machina adventure from off of the cliff as <laughs> shears all the way to that to uh, drink that... and margaritas i just don't know about that i think that's where the film started to lose me a little bit yeah yeah i totally agree i think all that shears stuff when he's like at a country club apparently or whatever for military guys and he's just chilling out drinking sipping margaritas and in my ties well uh, i think that, that the... even weakest part of the film yeah i think we got to slow down a little bit because he ends up in like this native village for for a second and we see him get mm -hmm. picked up after the kite and then sent away and then we see him like pass out in the boat and i, yeah. and I get the idea of building him up as this lucky but incompetent guy to set up the great <laughs> reveal that oh he's been lying about his rank mm -hmm. but ultimately in in a film that feels so intentioned and grounded I think that Shears just takes us on a really bizarre tangent that does circle yeah. back around in an interesting way when we get back on the way to the bridge. I want to talk about the climax of the film for sure, yeah, but, I, but I think that the, the, the broad stroke of, of, of Shears and what he brings is interesting, but I just don't like how it's executed. I think it feels really off tone. Yeah, it definitely. I, I agree with you a lot um, when he's when we're we're at the hospital and we're getting talking you know, in this relatively civilized space um, at the British encampment somewhere in mm. Southeast Asia. And um, yeah, it, it, it has this character that's a lot unlike, um, the character of the film changes a lot when we're in these scenes. It's very civilized, everyone salutes and they're in clean clothes and whatnot. And it's a little, it is a little bit pulled back from the, the very gritty, very like, oh shit, bad things are happening at this camp um, that I personally enjoyed uh, maybe a little bit more and I, I do think that this those scenes there it's it's slow there's a lot of exposition um that's probably the weakest you know half hour or so of the film um but it does pick up i i think it does pick up towards the end and as you said that the climax it's something to talk about for sure yeah uh, i think that it, it that sequence also makes for a few a few humorous moments to really break up some of the more harrowing stuff we cut back to and we saw it in the first act in the uh in the pow camp uh because I th there, there's just a few like fun like classic 1950s quip lines that are thrown around by the military guys there yeah uh, that i that, that i found fun but yeah i mean when you when you hold up those two like those two sections of the film side by side that stuff with uh, Shears is just very much lacking in the like the emotional weight because I care about Colonel Nicholson and, and his British soldiers and his his antagonistic relationship with uh, Colonel Saito and not a uh, bland American guy. Yeah. Now, I was thinking about why it was included in while I was watching it, why these scenes mm -hmm. were there. And I came to the, the idea maybe that perhaps actually showing the bridge being built isn't really that interesting at all. There's not a lot of mm -hmm. conflict once we've resolved this issue with Saito and the, the construction can just go full steam ahead. There's that mm -hmm. one scene where it's, it's, that, it's that final moment of, of Nicholson um, you know, asking his own sick men in the hospital to keep working so they can get it done, so they can build the bri the enemy's bridge on time. That's like, you know, our final moment, our final like, okay, he's like fully off. Like he wants to build this bridge more than anything else in the world and nothing matters to him but other than that there i just don't think it would, would have been very interesting to build just watch these guys build a bridge for like an hour like, yeah i don't actually i think that there's not very many plot points in that kind of narrative and so to shift away while yeah it's not as good i think i don't really know what else to do in that kind of situation mm. to come back to this See, end with the special forces See, I think I disagree with that a little bit because I, what I thought we were leading towards, and like you said, like the scene in, in the hospital sort of strikes out at this idea of of Nichols sort of becoming th the threat opposed to Saito in the eyes of his own men. I thought we were mm -hmm. kind of shifting in that direction where there is going to be now infighting within the British troops. I, and I kind of w was excited to see that dynamic shift from this, this struggle that we get with, with Clifton, but pretty much no one else of, well, are we basically just helping the army now? Is the, the Japanese army now, or are we still embodying this sort of 
you know, British military spirit that we're trying to uphold here. And I think mm-hmm. that those are the sort of, sort of thematic tensions that I wish got played out a little bit more. And I think get a little bit lost because of the sheer stuff. So while I don't think you could fill another hour of bridge building, I think you could probably fill half an hour of bridge building and take half an hour of the film and make it a little bit tighter and more interesting in its discussion of what happens post Saito because I kept waiting for another shoe to drop, whether that was Mm -hmm. Saito freaks out again or Nichols starts to lose support morale. I thought there was going to be another turn that would have added another shade of gray, but we didn't quite get that, I don't think. Yeah, it, no, I, you're, I think, you're I think right, we do. You know? It just happens very much at the end, and so it's like mm. the last turn in the film as opposed to a as to a middle turn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you guys want to talk about that 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 third act of like the the uh, the commandos tramping through the jungle and you know the the bridge being finalized until it's unfinalized? Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, uh, if you will. <laughs> yeah, we can we can get into that. Um, I think mm-hmm. that it's it's fairly interesting to see them go through the go through the woods and it's shot very nicely and um Mm -hmm. it's it provides some tension but it does fall into this thing that like yeah we i just don't care enough or i care but not as much about shears as i do about the bridge and about Nichols and the british guys it's this and and he's shears has got the the other british army guy whose name i don't remember who then gets injured in a fight and there's a little Mm -hmm. bit there but as far as like conflict goes, it is a pretty like there's the stakes are there, but the the the, thing, the obstacles aren't really that much to to really talk about in this sequence. They're just kind of traveling, and we kind of watch them travel for a little while, and then they get there. Um, and yeah. there's, so there's them not a their, whole uh, amount going on really. Them and their new Asian girlfriends, uh, <laughs> all traveling through the jungle. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like again, it, it's the same issue of that is necessary to get where the story is going narratively. But when you hold that up next to the the cutbacks to the the POW camp and Alec Guinness and Saito, it just doesn't hold up because again, Alec Guinness has that really interesting thing of like, yeah, I know that we might be. We might be helping the Japanese soldiers now by building this bridge and this railway and stuff, but he, you know, he's like, we have to put up the sign so the people remember the British morale and that we weren't, you know, crushed under the foot of the of the of the Japanese army in this POW camp, and all of that is a really interesting justification for his character so far. Is that like morale is number one? If you lose morale, you lose everything else. These guys stop being soldiers; they become prisoners. And that is very interesting to be him as a as a leader of these men. Yeah, um, I think that leads us pretty naturally into talking about the climax of this film, which is a pretty long, in terms of story beats, this last section where Shears and his uh, special forces friends need to blow up the uh, blow up the bridge, and the bridge is getting finalized, and there's the train. I think this is just an incredible sequence. I mean, it's. Mm-hmm. There's you you're like there's you I'm like oh but the bridge but you built the bridge and they've got to no! blow it up no not the bridge you know it's it's not the bridge on the river Kwai <laughs> there's I'm being tugged from all these different directions here because like you know logically I understand that you you have to blow the bridge up but like mm-hmm. emotionally I'm like ah oh, but they worked so hard how can they blow Check the bridge, bridge up they made the sign you know so I think that that the filmmaking in this section like really just jumps up another jumps up from this the the going through the jungle sequences. You've got the shots Mm -hmm. where they're down in the water and it's the nighttime photography and they're looking up and you can just barely see the feet moving through the slats and and the sound design is really helping, you know, sell if like they're they're trying to be quiet and they're strapping this to them and it's just this very, very tense sequence that I found myself just like gripping. And it continues. It's so tense. I think it's for like, I don't even know how long it is, like 20, 25 minutes is this sequence um, with that night and then the next day when they actually do blow it up. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, uh, if I may, I'd like to take a quick aside and talk and just compliment all the magnificent, like, cinematography and filmmaking elements that are in this, mm-hmm. because David Lean, obviously, this is shot, uh, almost entirely, uh, on location in Sri Lanka, not in, uh, wherever the film is set. Yeah. But, uh, it's just, the, the shots that David Lean gets here are magnificent. The, the use of him foregrounding things and then setting things far away on the horizon and using silhouettes. And, like, there's a shot where, the, like, there's a bunch of bats that fly into the sky. I'm like, oh, wait, th- 
those aren't CGI bats. Those, those are, are they had to they, wait for a, 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 a well, I don't know what you call a group of bats, but from a ton of these bats to fly yeah. and then get that on film. And there's a ton of instances of things like that where like these guys had to like haul all of this equipment through an actual jungle, set this up, and get and they still managed to get fantastic shots out of all of this. And it's, I think and, that's something. And they're not that, shooting yeah. with iPhones; they're shooting with fifties. You know, seventy millimeter cameras. Yeah. I mean, this is like yes. some intense haulage. You got to think about yes. being a grip on this set would have just been absolute hell. <laughs> that yes. would not have been fun. I would not have liked to uh, to help out. I'm not gonna lie. And you get these like grandiose wide shots of the river and the jungle and the POW camp, and it's all it has some fantastic scale to it. And I think it's just great. Hmm. Well, I I agree. I agree. To an extent, mm, I, I okay. think that it, I, okay. I think it again builds tension really well. I think one of the best shots I've seen in any film in a while is when they are putting the plastic charges and one of the Japanese sentries spits from on top of the bridge mm -hmm. down below, and it's right in front of the commando's face. There's yeah. a lot of great sequences like that. I love the conceit of waking up and seeing the riverbed is dry. There oh, are yeah. so many. There are so many great moments. I, I really think that it builds pretty well. But then I think it kind of loses me. I didn't mm. understand what was happening when everything goes wrong. It felt like a comedy of errors. Oh, the mortar hit him and he fell over onto the detonation box. But was he down there because he wanted to stop the explosive because the train had wounded men on it or because he wanted to not have the bridge roll up because he worked hard on it? Was he trying to help the Japanese? Was he trying to protect his own men? What was happening? What's the point of Joyce's character arc if he's just going to then with no hesitation kill Saito? Saito doesn't do anything. Joyce gets shot. Shears is dead in the river. Ultimately, it felt like we had this great windup of tension that mm. kind of just you, 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 that spring was wound too tight. It just popped for me, and I, mm. I didn't really get what we were saying. It seemed like okay, Nichols went too far, but that train had his men on it, and you're about to accidentally blow up all of the the wounded men, right? I don't think that there were no, wounded men was, on the train. It was it was Japanese going to be VIPs able to. that were on the yeah, train. It was going to it was going to be able to carry wounded men back. Across but the bridge, it what it wasn't coming with wounded men on. No, it, it had it, it had special figures and non non or it had military people who all Japanese though. There, I don't think there were any Brits on the train, which. Yeah. But didn't Nichols said I thought that uh, Saito was letting us come later with the wounded men when he gives a speech after the weird like like dance celebration <laughs> sequence. I think and we're going. I, I think it is going to be a yeah, different said, train. When it comes back through the POW camp, it will carry wounded men from okay. the POW camp to a hospital or somewhere. Okay, so so that's my bad. So but I, still, I don't know. When when the I hear you ask all quick. those questions, um, it it makes me think of what I got out of the last bit of that. Like, yeah, everything went bad. Nicholson went too far. He mm -hmm. was he he noticed it and he pointed it out to Saito, and he literally was working with the enemy in that moment. They were. The two of them were down there together, co-discovering the, the wire going to the plunger. Um, mm -hmm. And it, that was like the full realization of Nichols has gone so crazy for this bridge that he will like fight against his own side to, to keep it up, even when that means essentially fighting for the Japanese. And the end to me is like a, just a, an, a kind of an action sequence um, where I don't read a huge amount into... Um, you know, why, like Joyce stabbing um, Saito. That's him fulfilling his one character thing was like, oh, well, can we bring him or can we not if he isn't able to stab someone? He's able to stab someone in the end and it's Saito. That's, I guess, what I get out of it. There's not a, like a huge amount more in that specific action for me, but it is all really about the just like the struggle to blow it up, which is the right thing and how that is just goes wrong and yet it still ends up happening at the end i mean even with mm. the it looks kind of funny nowadays because that's kind of a trope i think in films to have someone fall or accidentally trigger the the the, the most important device in the film yes sure. i agree uh but no I, I i i'll disagree with you there abram uh, i think the the tension of that fi final sequence works pretty well even if it is a little funny that he's he like blah onto the <laughs> onto the trigger uh but I think he, his is coming to realization that he that he may have gone too far in trying to uphold the 
the morale of his men is, is pretty great. Uh, you have a good point about Joyce and all that stuff, too. Uh, as I as is a trend with everything I've said about this movie, uh, Alec Guinness is a high point. Uh, if, I, if, if I can drop in some more trivia here a second. Oh, yeah. Alec Guinness uh, wasn't like a super serious actor up to this point. It was actually pretty nervous about taking this role, taking a very serious role in a, in a war movie. And uh, throughout the whole thing, he would get into he would kind of get into altercations with David Lean about his character and like him his involvement in the film overall. Uh, so I've, I'll just read this verbatim. Okay, during shooting, Sir like Sir Alec Guinness continued to have doubts about his performance and the direction he was getting from Sir David Lean. To put Guinness at ease, Lean decided to show him a rough cut of certain sequences. One night, Lean ran ran over an hour's worth of film footage for Sir Alec Guinness, with Guinness's wife and son also attending. During the screening, nothing was said. At the end, Guinness, Guinness's family thanked Lean and promptly walked out, leaving Lean without a clue as to what would think their reaction. Would think of their reaction. Later that night, Lean received a visit from Guinness, who told him, to, who told him that he and his family had decided that Nicholson was the best thing that Guinness had ever done. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Do you know, cool. I, I actually have a, a bit of ancillary trivia to that. Oh my goodness. Is that Nick, that um that. Alec Guinness was not the first choice, but when mm. the I forget who who was go- going to play Nicholson originally was cast, and he found out they were going to be shooting in Sri Lanka, he's like, "No, I'm not going to the jungle. I'm not going out there." <laughs> and so, fair so, enough, you know. So they had it to looked fi- like it sucked. It looked like it sucked, and I'm sure it did. And so they had to scrounge yeah. together, and they and they ended up with Alec Guinness, and and mm-hmm. you know, arguably kicked off a pretty great dramatic career of his because he's yeah, is absolutely. Very good. I don't disagree with his family there. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just want to talk. We, we, we've gotten far enough. Let's talk about that explosion, that practical effect. Okay. Let's just right. have some fun here because I think there's only one other shot that really gets, that, that is close to it, um, and that's from Buster Keaton's The General when they do ah. ar- arguably the same thing just a couple, <laughs> you know, a couple decades earlier. Um, Blowing up the bridge with the train on it. Like you said with the bats, this was real. They really did yeah. blow up a train on a bridge. And my God, it's I, I love looking at stuff like that. That just I, makes the filmmaker and me so happy. It's just, it's really hard to, I, I, I just really enjoy stuff like this. When we get to Braveheart, uh, also a movie that I've seen, I also just had this like realization and like it just kind of blows your mind because we're in an era of CGI where you don't have to do things practically. But like if you, you're looking at it and you're like, it just feels more genuine. And then in your brain, you're even like, man, they actually blew up a bridge and crashed a train into a valley. And they, and they, they, had one they, shot. they filmed it. And now I'm seeing it, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and now we get cheap imitations with hacks like Christopher Nolan <laughs> crashing a plane into a hangar. Big whoop, Chris. Blow up a train sometime, then call me. <laughs> I also love the, like, speaking practically, like, the the just rank and file of POW's walking places. is yeah. such a magnitude of extras there. I think that those sequences were really impressive to me also. Yes. A little bit less show-stopping than the bridge and the train, but I think no <laughs> less important to selling sort of the magnitude of the entire experience. And and Tanner, I, I want to give you an assist here because you said you had some kind of whistling, oh, yes. marching uh, trivia, and I'd love to hear that. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> I'll read this verbatim as well. Director Sir David Lean initially wanted Nicholson's soldier to sing... Oh, actually, no, I'm not going to read this because that's a spoiler for the trivia. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do this myself. Okay. So the song of the whistling, which I didn't know was from this movie, uh, but it's actually a a pretty common, you know, like little little tune called Colonel Bogey March. And during World War II, there was a bit of a parody that was made of this. Uh, the title of that parody was Hitler Has Only Got One Ball. <laughs> and David Lean wanted the soldiers to actually be singing the lyrics to that song while they marched into camp. And the studio was like, uh, no, because that's you. We can't we can't put that on film because it's 1957. We can't talk about testicles, uh, uh in this movie. So they they so they just whistled it. But uh, in in lieu of our typical uh, our typical quests wheel song, I will be singing a my my rendition of Hitler has only got one ball when we do the spin later in this episode. Oh, what thank, a treat! Thank you so much. Well, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think we're not far from the spin. We got a little bit more discussion to do, and that has to do with our vote. 
We've, yes. I've received some numbers, and so we've got a uh, a number here. It's nine point seven five. Okay. But okay, we're very spread out. Okay, we're mm. very very spread out here. So I'll start at the bottom. Abram put it at place number twenty two. And we go to the next highest place, which is me. I put it at number 11. And then we go to the final resting spot where Tanner voted at number six. So we're like all over the map here. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. What do you oh, think? Oh, yeah, we are. What's the process of reconciling this? What do you think? Can, oh, can I have that okay. number again? 9.7. Is that what you said? 9.75. Out so of 30. Yeah, this would be going, yeah, this would be going, going at, at number, number 10. Correct. Between Spotlight uh, between and Nomad Land, correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. That's, okay. that's that's the place where it would go. Below spotlight, above Nomadland. Um, I you know, I'm fine with it. Uh, I I'll I'll concede that you know I, I'm a little higher on this than especially Aram and even you uh, slightly a bit Timo. Uh, but I was really really just uh, enraptured by a lot of this. Even the uh, Colonel, even the Shears stuff, which I wasn't high on. I still recognize it's needed for the narrative of the film. And, you know, compared to a lot of other, like, lows of other Best Picture winners we've seen, I still enjoyed it quite a bit because uh, I, I still liked uh, William Holden as, as Shears and some in those sequences. They just didn't really hold a candle to the Alec Guinness stuff. It's, you know, comparing, you know, maybe like a, a 9 to a 10 in terms of sequences. Maybe like a 9, maybe like a, maybe like a 7 and to a 10. <laughs> I watched this movie a week ago, and so a lot of, you know, having had some more distance from it, I think, you know, makes me think a little bit more like, yeah, okay, I think those 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 sequences in the middle to second half of the film mm-hmm. aren't quite as engaging as the rest. But I, I agree with you that it is it is like a 7 out of 10 to a 10 out of 10, because yeah. those other sequences are just like so engaging and just make yes. me want to give it more. But Abram, I want to hear... About your thoughts about this, because you you are the you're yeah. the, the outlier in this situation. Yeah, and I really I really didn't expect I was going to be a, a contrarian to this degree uh, when we got to the ranking. And ultimately, right. I'm fine. I, we we can we can have it at number ten. I think that's totally fine. I I don't think if I wrestled it down to number eleven, it really <laughs> is any closer no. to a reflection of mine. And I think frankly that that's fine. For me, I just think that. The stuff that's good is so good that when we spend such a substantive chunk of the movie away from that, I just can't help but feel disappointed. And I think that mm. when we're thinking about the Shears things in particular, if I can only half care about Shears, I can barely care about his ensemble that he introduces, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like that does a lot to take away from what is such a a character and motivation focused study between Nichols and Saito, which I think is the, is the heart of the film. And... I wanted more of that. I, I think that had the second half of the film really told me what what were the politics within the the, the British army when mm. the officers took over. I think we could have really completed one very nuanced and interesting thematic um, element instead of sort of introducing this American character who's kind of seemingly above everyone else and and, and seemingly has no real respect for military authority taking over the role of a commando stolen valor all of this but Mm. that doesn't really feel like it goes anywhere to me i feel like for as precise as the film is in a lot of respects it's it's equally meandering and that just doesn't result in experience that i find wholly satisfying even if i do find the entire film engaging just on an entertainment level but when i'm thinking about all of the films we have i think that we have a lot more that say something complete and for me, this this doesn't, even in spite of so much of the film, I think, being really interesting and nuanced. I just wish that the entire film was. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Well, good good point. I just want to say, yep. this is, I love this film. It's it's very good. It's my least favorite David Lean film. Um, oh. I, I, think, I think Dr. Zhivago is a little better because that's a very weird but mind-blowing film. And then there's Lawrence, which we'll save for another day. Um, yes, we'll, we'll get to Lawrence another day. Uh, Abram, I did want to say, I could tell you didn't really like the film because you continually got the name of Alec Guinness's character wrong. <laughs> what is his name? His name is Nicholson, and you called him Nichols. Oh, well, I, I yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I bet that Quest audience has caught on by now that I'm not very good with character names. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> we, we, we still love you. 
I could have called him old, old Ben Kenobi, and I didn't. So you should be thankful for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank we you. we've all got our tells for when we don't like the movie, and and <laughs> soon by the end of the series, um, Quest viewers will have them down. They'll they'll get into the intro and they'll be like, ah, oh, well, Timo, he's not into this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you think it's time? Do you think it's time to revive oh. revive a, a, an oldie an oldie song, and um, yes, and find out how many balls Hitler has. <laughs> yes, and, and various other uh, various other uh, German military figures that, who also make an appearance in the song. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, well, it's spin time, baby. Let's get that wheel okay. going. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, three, two, one. Hitler has only got one ball. Goring has two, but very small. Himmler is rather similar, but poor old Goebbels has no balls at all. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant, Tanner. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, as you could, as you saw during that song, we got a number. It was thirty-one. So, what film oh, is number thirty-one? Thirty-one, you say? Thirty-one, right in the middle. Right in the oh, middle. Oh, hello. We got a we got a little a, a little musical again, if a you will. A little musical again. What is it? From nineteen sixty-eight. Starring Ron Moody, Shani Wallace, and Oliver Reed, directed by Carol Reed. It's Oliver. It's not. Ol- it's not just Oliver. It's Oliver. Oliver. There's an exclamation point at the end. Is this based on Oliver Twist? It is based on Oliver Twist. Oh. It's a, a cl- the classic Charles Dickens novel. I'm a Dickens enjoyer. Yeah. Dickens. I I kind of am a Dickens enjoyer too. So, who knows? I mean, you know, it's a it's a musical. That's that's something. Yes. Directed by a woman. It's long. It's it's long. It's 150 minutes. Yes. Here's a fun and, fact uh, for you. It's not, it's not actually directed by a woman. Oh. It's just a guy named Carol. What? First of all. Oh my god! I sound like an idiot yeah. now. Yeah, that's so, okay. That's all right. Yeah. So in my great true. literature class, um, mm-hmm. in one of my college semesters of past, my my professor uh, was in a performance of Oliver, and when we read Oliver Twist oh. in his class, he gave us a little bit of a of a live performance. So I've seen some clips from this movie. I've I've heard my professor do the songs better than they do it in the film. So and there's a lot of writing on this one for me. We'll see how it uh-huh. goes. Okay. Well, um, I'm I'm kind of looking forward to this. I mean. Something, something new, and something mm-hmm. I didn't exactly expect for this week. I don't really a long, a long musical. Boy, oh boy, something new for Quest. <laughs> <laughs> well, there oh you go. Boy. We'll be back next week to talk about Carol Reed, Sir Oliver, um, mm-hmm. and uh, and well, you know, you might have noticed Tucker is missing this week. He'll be back next time, yes. and I'm sure he's going to be full of great and insightful topics about Oliver. And uh, yes. I hope I hope you two are, and I hope I've got a couple thoughts in my brain about the film too. I'm glad you enjoyed um, Bridge on the River Kwai, and uh, and well, thank you for hanging out and chatting me chatting with me. If you're listening to this, remember to download and rate it five stars and do that stuff. If you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, join our Discord. You can come chat. We've got movies channels. You know, we we talk about movies in them, what we're watching currently. It's a great old jolly time. Jolly good yeah. was one of one of my favorite bits from um, the the movie. <laughs> Despite our gripes about the middle sequence, where where Shears is like getting told that he's going to go on this horrendous jungle trip, and everyone's like, <laughs> oh, yes, very good, jolly good, good sport," and he's like, "Oh yeah, jolly good." Like he's like mocking them that was pretty funny that was a good little bit of people a little british people humor there for me Mm -hmm. that i quite like all right we'll see you next week peace so long this is not this is a piece of trivia i learned and it's not going to fit into the conversation so i'll just drop it in now okay do you guys remember that part in the movie where like shears just randomly like has a girlfriend yeah yeah yeah. like that white lady uh that was apparently because the the studio was like uh, you need to put a white woman in this film because you only have women of color in it. Oh my god! So, so you need to put a white woman in it, and they're like, "Fucking all right, I guess." David Lean is like, "It doesn't fit in my story at all." He, he, he's <laughs> like, he, he's, "That's exactly his reaction." It's like, "It doesn't fucking fit in the movie." I they they shot that after everything else, and he he was I pissed. Will, I will only have borderline underage-looking Siamese women in my fucking movie, and that's it. <laughs>